Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. The ten dollar found a father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self starter. starter. To your union, to your union. and the hope that you. is Hamilton. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection podcast. Uh, I'm really excited. We have a very special episode today. We're talking with the team behind Hamilton, both the original Broadway show and the uh, the theatrical version and the and, and, and what's now streaming into your homes on Disney+. Plus. So uh, we have an amazing team today uh, to talk with us about this uh, show. And once again, uh, we're coming to you using the Dolby On app, which is... Uh, uh, an iOS and Android application, which is designed to make recording audio and video very simple uh, with great quality. So uh, thrilled to have the team here. Um, so I'm going to go around and just do some introductions. We have Alex Lackamore, who is the, the music supervisor and did the orchestrations on the show. Hi, Alex. Hey, how are you, Glenn? Good, good. Um, I'll, I'll um, embarrass Alex slightly by calling it his multiple Tony uh, Emmy and, and Grammy awards uh, for uh, not only Hamilton, but In the Heights and, and Dear Evan Hansen and lots of other amazing shows. Um, also from the original Broadway team, we have uh, sound designer Nevin Steinberg. Hi, Nevin. Hey, go ahead. Also uh, a Tony winner for Hades Town, which I had the experience of seeing last year, which was completely amazing and then from the uh from the film team uh we have re-recording mixers tony Vallant and rob fernandez hi guys hi glenn hi glenn uh i know these guys because they both have had the distinction of mixing dolby institute fellowship winning movies uh tony mixed reed morano's uh movie i think we're alone now uh which was just uh, if you haven't had a chance to see that you should you should check out Reed's movie. It's really beautiful sound design, which was actually done by Dan Timmons, who's on the line with us as well. Dan uh, did the, the, is the sound editor uh, on the film. Hi, Dan. Hey, Glenn. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Rob, uh, I know very well because he mixed uh, D. Ree's movie Mudbound, which we were involved with as well, which was a, a, another amazing film. So um, it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a reunion for you guys. You haven't seen each other in a long time. Uh, no, we haven't. <laughs> and we're also um, we're also joined today by uh, my colleague at Dolby, uh, Tom McAndrew, who's the senior technical manager uh, for content uh, relations. And I'm, I'm pleased to have Tom on the show uh, joining us today because he's not only an expert in uh, Dolby Atmos for the home, but uh, he's a, a huge musical theater nerd and a big fan of <laughs> of uh, Hamilton. So uh, it's Indeed a, it's I am. a a good a good team today to talk about this show um alex i wanted to start with you um you know as i was doing some research and and looking around online i i came across that amazing video of you and lynn manuel miranda doing the uh performance at the white house in 2009 2009 back when this was still sort of referred to as a as a, as a concept album or the hamilton mixtape how does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished and squalor grow up to be a hero and a scholar the ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self-starter by 14 they you placed him in charge of the trade and charter tell us about the process you know you're the the musical director you also did the orchestration and the arrangements. What's your process for working with uh, Lynn Manuel? And, and you know, tell us about just this amazing journey. Like you've been with the show, obviously, for uh, a, a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was fortunate enough to meet Lynn Manuel 
when we started working on In the Heights around 2004. And um, it's always been, for me, the, the ideal relationship. It's been perfect because um, we, we complement each other in, uh, in a way that I feel is very organic and, and very rich. Um, Lynn can play the piano, but he will admit that he's not, uh, he's mostly self-taught. Um, and, uh, when he would bring in songs in the early days of Heights, this was before he was doing really fleshed out demos. Some of those early drafts would be lyrics typed up on a sheet with chord symbols written above. And he would sit down at the piano and give me the, the basic feel and the gist of what he wanted it to be. And then he would say, okay, Lack, you sit down at the piano. I would love to hear your version of this. And through that, I was able to add, uh, ideas about, hey, maybe the bass line could do this, you know, what if the song ended this way? And how about this as a potential hook for the piano part? And so uh, throughout those meetings and throughout those instances of me just kind of suggesting stuff, they became part of, a, a, of the music in that way. So it allowed me to be really what I think an arranger is, which is taking what's given to you from composer and uh, trying to elevate it, trying to make it serve the story, trying to recycle motifs, trying to make uh, uh, the piece um, in service of what's happening on stage. So uh, I'm thankful that Lin Manuel is one of these composers that he's not, you know, looking over my shoulder and micromanaging and, and questioning everything I do. He's much more open and collaborative and ideas that I throw out to him, he will always be honest and tell me, hey, that's too busy or, or that's too much or, you know, or, or that's great, whatever it is. But I, I, it's always in service of his composition. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's the perfect position for me because it allows me to be part of the process, but not totally, uh, you know, the, the, the one in the front. Uh, you know, it, it's like it's the perfect sideman gig for, for someone like me who likes to be noticed, but not that much. <laughs> Well, and uh, you certainly weren't noticed uh, even in the film. You're you're the you conducted the the pit orchestra, right? So you you appear in the in the film. I think you probably get spit on by Jonathan Groff at least at one point. <laughs> definitely, I definitely did. Yeah, no, it, it's um, and I I give uh, much praise to Tommy Kale for preserving the live element of this film, and and that's something that I really want to bring up is that. This film it is a live capture of the theater experience. And it is two live performances of the show in front of an audience. Uh, and, you know, these were people, uh, we didn't say, hey, we're filming Hamilton, come see us. You know, these were people that happened to buy tickets to see a Broadway show and they walk in and realize there's nine cameras set up to, to capture what they're about to see. So, you know, it wasn't like we were stopping in the middle of a performance to redo a number and try another take uh, for those songs. This is what happened at that moment in time. And, um, and to that end, the fact that you every now and then hear an audience member laugh and, you know, maybe you'll hear a cough here and there that we couldn't edit out <laughs> as much as we tried or, or you'll see my hand come up from the podium, all that. I, I love that Tommy wanted to still preserve the feeling that you were seeing a live experience, which is something, you know, it takes us back to like the MGM days, right? Where you see like the long takes of someone doing entire dance numbers uh, without stopping. That that, that um, performance aspect is something that I love that I think uh, was important for us to preserve in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's such a unique way to experience the show. We'll come back to that. Um, Nevin, I, I had a similar question for you, which is you're part of the core team um, that was working on this from the beginning, and you'd worked with Lin-Manuel previously on on In the Heights. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, like, I think, you know, especially for, for our audience on the, the Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection podcast, in our world, the term sound designer has a very specific meaning. What does it mean to do sound design for a Broadway show? And uh, what, you know, what's, how, how does your role in this work out? Yeah, uh, yeah, I met, I met Lynn back in the, in the Heights days as well. Um, that's also where I met Lack. And, um, you know, those were, those were salad days for us all. And, and, you know, they, they were special. They're still special in my heart. And, um, it's, it's nice to have a relationship with, with people over a long period of time and, and feel like you're, you're not just creating a particular project, but sort of a body of work together. That's something I think that we're all very grateful for. Um, and, and particularly to, to Lynn and to Tommy as well for including us in that. Um, yeah, sound designers on Broadway uh, basically are, you know, kind of in charge of anything you hear in the theater from, from uh, atmospherics to spot sound effects to uh, the entire amplification of a play or a musical. So, um, you know, on Hamilton, for example, we have well over 130 microphone inputs running live, and those are all coming in 
to uh, the sound system being distributed to the theater in a rather complex distribution system. And so my job is to sort of manage that beast. And uh, that's the technical side of it. From a creative side, uh, it's working with people like Blackmore and uh, the composers uh, and the writers and the director and the rest of the design team to use the tools we have with sound to help tell the story. And sometimes that can be a very complex undertaking, you know, one that involves uh, a lot of big gestures and things you might notice. And sometimes it's very, very subtle. And that just depends on the material and sort of the taste of the people involved and the style you're trying to uh, accomplish at any given moment. Uh, Nevin, I know, I know from um, our previous conversations that, um, and, and you just touched on it, but a lot of your job is basically designing a custom sound system for the theater. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the Richard Rogers Theater, which is where this the, the, the recording originally happened? And and I, I, I can imagine sometimes when you're dealing with these historic old Broadway houses, you have specific limitations in sort of terms of where you can put speakers and that sort of thing. So talk a little bit about the challenges of actually designing this, the the system to play back in the theater for the show. Yeah, I mean, and, and any Broadway show or any show in a in an architectural venue of any kind, you know, where that you're 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 accommodating the geometry of that particular space. And the Rogers is uh, like a lot of Broadway theaters, uh, you know, a complex uh, geometric space. It's multi levels, uh, a lot of angles, a lot of shadowed box seating areas. Um, you know, so you have to service a lot of individual listening zones, um, which requires a very complex output scheme and uh, mix is sort of feeding those outputs, which is a little bit different than more of like a pop approach or even a cinematic approach. Um, uh, although I think, uh, you know, cinema mixing is, is starting to approach the number of outputs that we're typically using in a, in a theater. Um, the, the, the Rogers is, um, you know, is, is, uh, it's a great old theater. Um, and, you know, Fortunately, uh, I had spent a lot of time there already. I did some of my early Broadway mixing in that theater as an engineer. Um, I live mixed two productions in that theater back in the late 90s. Uh, and then uh, I actually met my wife in that theater, uh, also back in the late 90s, uh, seeing <laughs> That's the show. That's amazing. It's an amazing place for me. And so, and then of course we did, uh, uh, with Acme, I did a number of shows in there and then uh, including in the Heights. Uh, and then of course, uh, Hamilton uh, going in there just felt like it just felt like the right place to be. Um, I know people really love the theater uh, from a visual point of view because the the orchestra seating rakes up at a pretty steep angle in the back, so it gives you a very good view of the stage from the rear orchestra, uh, and you sort of get on top of it a little bit. So choreography gets really highlighted in there, which of course is a big strong suit of Hamilton, um, and I like it just because it's familiar. So in terms of uh, speaker positions and and where where things can go and can't go, yeah, a lot of it is determined just simply by the physical space. Uh, by the architecture itself. Uh, you're also uh, driven by the geometry of the seating areas and trying to sort of uh, reverse engineer where speakers can go to, to accomplish uh, covering those areas uh, as best you can. And then you have to collaborate with uh, scenic and lighting, of course, to, uh, to try and get speakers in places where you might want them, but they might interfere with sight lines or scenic pieces or lighting shots. So there's a kind of a round robin of, in my perfect world, I'd put speakers here, but that's where a scenic piece is gonna go and we don't wanna block that, so we'll move the speaker and then maybe they'll move the scenic piece and, it's, and then the lighting designer comes in and they need an angle that your speaker might be blocking, so you have to clear that angle. They might move a lighting instrument to accommodate a speaker position and that goes on for sometimes months prior to the uh, install. Um, Nevin, we're going to talk more later about how the production was actually brought uh, to television and how it was conceived for Dolby Atmos as a three-dimensional mix, but can you talk a little bit about, um, did you do immersive audio in the theatrical space versus just simply amplifying what was on the stage and coming from the orchestra, or was there any kind of three-dimensional element uh, actually in the theater? Yeah, there's a there's a pretty extensive surround system uh, installed for Hamilton uh, right from the get-go. We had it downtown off-Broadway, sort of a you know, the sort of prototype for it and then, you know, obviously scaled it up for Broadway. So, uh, and that's not, that's not unusual, uh, you know, on shows uh, that both have the resources for it and call for it uh, sort of dramatically. And in terms of the storytelling and Hamilton certainly felt like a story where we could, we could bring the sound into the audience in some pretty creative ways. So yeah, there's, there's speakers, uh, surround speakers on every, on all seating levels uh, for, for the Richard Rogers and, and we use them throughout the show. They're, they're, it is not an on and off situation. They're, they're, they're pretty much there the whole time. And it just depends on which material we're bringing in and, and how we get it there and get it out. Yeah. 
Well, I want to acknowledge to um, our, our friends at Disney who have given us some clips uh, from the from the show um, to to listen to and, and talk about specific moments. Um, before we roll the first clip, um, which is from the beginning of the show, it's the Alexander Hamilton number. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of take a step back, and Alex and Nevin, um, Alex, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago that this is it's a capture of, of two live performances of the show. Um, I'm, I'm aware from what I, I read as well that there was at least one day of, of uh, additional photography, um, and I believe that that was steady cam work and stuff on stage to get close ups. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, uh, and you also, you, you talked about Tommy Kale, the, the director of both the stage version and the, and, and the film. Can you talk about what, just taking a step back, what was the concept and the approach to capturing this? And what, what did you, what experience did you guys want the audience to have? Um, that's a great question. You know, I, I, um, uh, Tommy will always say this more eloquently than I would, but he, he wanted to give everybody the best seat in the house. And uh, you're absolutely right. Aside from those two live performances, uh, we spent uh, an afternoon, sorry, an evening on Sunday. So we, in front of a live audience, we did a Sunday matinee and a Tuesday evening performance. We spent Sunday evening doing some of what you said, some steady cam, on stage camera work, and we spent a lot of the day Monday doing the same. And uh, that was for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we didn't want to have cameras on the stage during the actual live performance because we didn't want to detract uh, the, the experience for, um, from the experience for the audience who was there to see the full show. Because those and, people had paid a lot of money for those tickets. Uh, yeah. But, but right? not only that, you know, and this is again like a big credit to Tommy. He wanted us to be able to just do our thing. Because you have to consider that by that point we had been doing the show for a year and a half, some of us. So it was in our, our we had grown into it in a certain way where when it came time to turn that red light on, Yes, we were conscious that it was being filmed. Yes, we, you know, elevated it to a certain level because we were like, oh my God, we have to make it perfect. You know, this is going to be preserved. But at the end of the day, we were just doing what we knew how to do, which is perform. So, um, he, he wanted to make sure that there was nothing in the way that would prevent us from doing what feels natural to us in the context of performing. So that's why for the time spent for the onstage camera work, you know, uh, so th that was one aspect of it. But the other is just how cool that is to see. And I'm thinking back to uh, back to our in the Heights days and I remember us doing some similar steady cam work on that for our, our b-roll stuff and that was at the time a very newfangled thing like you know that was not a lot of shows that were doing that for the commercials or for the b-roll footage but I think that's always kind of stuck in our mind as a really cool way to, to experience theater uh, that you don't necessarily get to do when you're sitting in the audience to get up that close and to see the sweat coming off someone's brow of, of what they you know what they have to um, uh Manufacture and all the effort that it takes to make a performance happen with the level of emotion and intensity that it requires. I think it's really cool. So all this to say, we just wanted to have options and they were very specific about what moments they wanted to capture and they plotted in advance, okay, we want to have a camera on stage for Skylar Sisters and for the duel, et cetera. And they mapped out moments that they thought would have maximum cinematic impact. And uh, that's what that was about. The word got around, they said this kid is insane, man. Took a book collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came. And the world's gonna know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things I haven't done. But just you wait, just you So that was Alexander Hamilton. I think, you know, one of the questions that I had from you guys from a, a creative conceptual standpoint, and, and Tony and, and Rob, this is for you as well. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you gain by this particular way of approaching the material is you get to use close-ups, which is a particularly cinematic form of expression and it was a beautiful moment in that right right when Lynn manuel enters as as alexander hamilton you see him for the first time um and you do play with different perspectives like the camera pops back to the back of the stage when king george enters there's some overhead shots so typically in in cinematic mixing 
in, in the language that we're all sort of familiar with, when you have perspective shifts like that, you, you also have audio perspective shifts. But you guys sort of made a rule that that, that doesn't adhere in this Hamilton cinematic world. Um, I, I feel like if you close your eyes, the experience is continuous f- throughout from an audio perspective of being like probably fifth row center or somewhere like that. So can you talk about creatively that difference between what's going on visually and what's going on from a sound perspective and, and, and why that was important for the experience of the show? We definitely, uh, we wanted there to be perspectives, but not to have them be distractive. So when the camera does shift or it follows a character on the stage, we chose to sometimes follow that character. If there's two people singing left and right on the stage, pan them a little bit. There's, there's an awful lot of perspective and uh, panning going on. We tended to, for the smaller screen, I, I, I think, Rob, I think you can, you can chime in on this as I saw a lot of the notes as they came in, we tended to <laughs> step the panning and movement a little, a little tighter because it was distracting on a, on a, in a smaller scale. But I, I think in the, in the full screen in a movie theater, um, we'll probably open it up a little bit more to get back to what we had originally done, which was try to follow characters around on the screen um, do subtle shifts if they're one one singer is closer and the other singers were slightly back. Lots of perspective stuff, but as I said, we always try to do it where you didn't notice it. So the fact that you're saying you could close your eyes and listen to it and it didn't take you out, that was that meant that we were success successful. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Tony, because I did make a a note that uh, the second time I I went back and I watched it twice to prepare for this. The second time I I listened very closely on headphones and I did notice like and there's a beautiful moment and it must be nice when, you know, Burr is uh, is far screen right. And the the, the panning of the of the voices was really was really lovely, but and and, and very and very specific. But I think at this point, I would like to um, just uh uh, ask a question and clarify. So Tony, y- you, you came in pretty quickly after the material was captured and did the original, what was intended to be a cinematic mix. And then when the plan changed for the, the film to then come out, uh, on streaming, um, Rob, then you came in and did a Dolby Atmos pass. So can you guys talk a, a little bit about that and sort of how, how things, um, were, were handed off between the two of you? I mean, early on in the project, um, I was able to go to the theater and and watch a performance with the original cast, which was was a very important thing to do. Get sort of get get you know used to what it sounded like in the theater. And um, what I noticed right away was just how much low end and low frequency the show had compared to most Broadway shows. And I wanted to make sure we could we could you know capture that and 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 present that in a theatrical sense, in a movie sense. Um, it was a huge undertaking. We we had to get m- numerous people involved early on. So Tim Lathan, who is a fantastic award winning mix engineer, mixed the cast album with Alex. Um, he came on very early on to, to sort of get a, uh, he mixed stereo in his home and got a great premix going before it was brought into the theatrical theater for me to start mixing theatrically. Um, he probably spent a good three weeks, um, premixing and it was a lot, there was a, it was very technical trying to figure all this out. We, uh, Dan, Dan, Timmons, my right hand man, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the show was recorded in 96 K and we, we, yeah. So we, there was no way that we could handle hundreds and hundreds of tracks checkerboarded between takes a huge session with a gazillion plugins. We decided to get everything at 48 K 
And we did some, as Dan mentioned, we did some blind tests, did some listening. And, and what we found out is converting 96K to 48K still was better sounding than if it was recorded just at 48K. There was some, there was, yeah, there was something. So it was great that it was recorded at 96. Um, and so we converted, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt and tell you, you know, the show runs at 96 live also. Yeah. Cool. So, th- you know, that's like, that's, that's what, that's why we, you know, that's why the capture was 96 too, because we were already there. I had a question for Dan about the uh, the actual uh, editorial process because I, the show is seamless. You could not tell there were edits, there were cuts between performances. I'm curious how you took the two live performances plus the uh, the close up uh, state of cam inserts and kind of wrangled it all down to one seamless performance. Did you kind of use one show as the master and then just take bites of other ones when you needed it? And did everything cut, or did you use like the orchestra bed? from the primary performance, but just drop in vocals. Like, to, Tell us a little bit about the editorial process to get it to one seamless performance. Sure, I, I, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't completely seamless moving from, uh, you know, one day to the next when I received the material, but it had seen a lot of work before it even got to me. Uh, the, there was, it was a traditional film crew that, that dealt with everything until it even got to us. So a film editor, Jonah Moran had put in months and months of work stitching together the different performances plus the uh, the inserts, the close-ups, and uh, there's also a music editor on board, uh, Annette Kudrak came in, she was tweaking edits along the way, uh, and then it finally got turned over to me like a traditional film where I just got the mix track, which I had to expand out to the 160 or 90 tracks, whatever it might be, so that was a few weeks of work right there uh, to get that to get that happening and then and then from there it was a it was like any other film um tweaking each edit as we went um and i started off um kind of from the ground up working uh with uh with, with tim latham's uh, editor Derek lee he came in and helped me cut the drums together and percussion and just cleaned up all the tracks started from there and then we just kind of worked it up it was kind of it was kind of like polishing a stone um over and over again and under a very tight deadline with very under, understanding, uh, you know, <laughs> overseers. I was going to say, only because Tom brought it up, something that was kind of interesting when you asked about trying to uh, interlace uh, uh, an orchestra bed with a vocal bed. We actually didn't really have that option because there was so much bleed on all the microphones that by and large, the takes had to be en masse. So everything kind of had to go together. It was not really... Uh, something that we could play with and say, oh, let's grab a, a vocal performance from the second night on top of an orchestra performance on the first. There would always be some kind of a, a, a bleed that prevented us from doing so. So it, it's kind of nice to know that what you hear is the live experience in that way. It was super clean. And, and the, the vocal performances specifically, I honest, honestly clears a bell. And uh, having a little bit of experience doing live musical theater mixing myself, I know the bane of the mixer is sometimes when two performers are standing close to each other and you have to duck the microphones so they're not you're not picking up both of them, they're comb filtering. How much cleanup did you do on the vocal tracks to get them all isolated and tidy so that you could mix everybody together without the mics interfering with each other? I'd say luckily we, we were given enough time to do as much as you would on an album. We really got in there and, and cleaned it up like an album. It was a it was a great hybrid between a live show and a music album and a I'll also add that, you know, some of the notes that were coming down as the mix was completing were still you guys were still doing that. Like that's the amazing thing. Like right to the very end of the deadline, a lot of like little tiny tweaks and edits on things like mic interactions or open mics that might just be the tail might come down just to get rid of some of the you know the uh, ambience like the the attention to detail uh right through the whole process is i think what what you're hearing is the kind of just the revisitation of this of the same kind of rigor that went into the very beginning in the bedrock you know, performances and takes that were used to make the film were the same kind of things that, you know, these guys were doing all the way to the end. It didn't, it didn't stop. It wasn't like, okay, they're clean. We're good to go. It was like, nope, you know, we can still make that little cut better and that little edit better, that little tail better. And it was, those little things really make a big difference. So that's, I think that's a testament to the work right through to the, through the deadlines that that these guys did on on the movie. It it was extraordinary. Rob, uh, I wanted to to ask you, so, um, so Tony, you you did the original um, 
7.1 mix that was um, that was intended to be a theatrical release. And then at some point, the decision was made to um, pull it up by over a year and 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 put it out on on Disney Plus um, uh, over July Fourth weekend, which turns out to be a pretty inspired choice because the Twitterverse has just really been exploding with energy and enthusiasm about Hamilton. So I know Tony, you weren't available to come back in and, and do this uh, secondary pass, and that's Rob when you came in. But the decision was also made at that point to to do. Um, to do that in Dolby Atmos. So can you talk about, you know, the process of, of what you did and kind of um, bringing that mix into, into Atmos? It was a pretty tall order when it was presented to me. It seemed that, you know, this thing that they have been working on for a year and a half or something, all of a sudden we had to get it ready in like a month uh, or less than a month. Um, uh, but luckily the handoff went pretty smoothly. Uh, I a the, the session is so big, it's hundreds of tracks. And, uh, you know, some of them are being used at a certain point, some of them are not, uh, you know. So uh, luckily, like, Tony knew the session inside out, and he sort of pointed it, pointed to me, uh, uh, pointed out to me, like, where everything was horizontally. And then as I started mixing and getting feedback from the crew, uh, I saw that, you know, someone like Alex or Nevin, like they knew the session horizontally, like down to the frame. So they'll tell you exactly where to go. <laughs> so I was able to, once I, we got this interaction going, I was able to find myself around the session, uh, around the mix pretty easily. Um, the, uh, the great thing that I found out early on when I, I first sat down right in this room and started trying to figure out how to translate it was that they had this amazing, room mic recordings uh which tony had pointed out like you know you should look into this room mics i don't know how many mics there were at least eight maybe ten yeah i think there might have it might have been 12 yeah there were, there were a lot yeah i think it's eight pair eight pair i think nevin you didn't do any you didn't do anything half-assed did you on this <laughs> i i, I did i had nothing to do with that part of the capture that's the funny <laughs> thing like there are no room mics we have one room mic up for like the live show just for monitoring backstage this was something that was brought in specifically for the capture. This was not, yeah, no, of course, guys, why would you have yeah. live room mics in your theatrical <laughs> yeah. production, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, these mics <laughs> were, were amazing. So I just started placing them around the room uh, and that became the bed for the Amos mix. And uh, 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 I started like doing passes on it and say, oh, this really like holds up. I mean, I started just moving them back and forth uh, until it felt natural and then uh, and then took it from there and then just started like turning maybe certain points, uh, uh, especially sound effects and things like that. Just, you know, you could play around with that stuff around the room. So, Rob, conceptually, those those room mics, were you using those to capture like audience reaction or was it really about like getting reverb from the from the the sound of the performances on stage and filling out the room? That it's, it's a natural reverb of the room. I mean, it really is. I, I've never saw the lo the show live, but I would imagine that this is what it sounds like being in there. Uh, because, uh, yeah, the, the room mics are running through the entire show. Um, so it's not just like going in for reactions or crowd or anything. They're there the entire time. So at home, people are hearing things in the surrounds and the overheads. And part of that is the actual acoustic space of the Richard Rogers. Is, wow. That's correct. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, that, that means Glenn, that means when someone coughs, it's on sixteen. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Glenn, you talked about uh, perspectives. There's a couple of real quick shots from like the ceiling, looking down onto yes. the stage. Yes, and I knew I couldn't go too too crazy with it, but there are little slight perspective shifts when when you go to that shot that I just went heavier with the rooms. And we actually put two room mics up in that ceiling. And we you know, lean on those a little bit. Again, it's all very subtle stuff, but, um, but the, it's, an, it's a very quick move for the automation, just popping up, pulling the, the mains down and pushing the rooms up just at that moment. But that stuff is going on throughout the whole show, riding these room mics that Rob is talking about, you know, just blending those yeah and we did some of that in the atmos mix uh 
it's true that the perspective shifts are very subtle. Like you don't want to like, I don't know, sort of like reveal that there's a camera, you know, following them on stage. Uh, but there is there is some of it. I, I remember like on Say No to This, when they, they think they're sitting down uh, for the last little vocals. I've had, the vocals are kind of why I sort of like dry them up as the camera comes in closer to them. I remember uh, there's a few instances like that. We, we did play with a little bit of the perspective. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at our second clip. This is uh, from the number satisfied, um, and this is this is right after uh, Alexander's uh, wedding to Eliza. And uh, in this particular song, uh, her sister Angelica is ex is expressing a little a little bit of regret um, about what what might have what might have uh, what might have been. Um, so let's take a listen to this. Angelica Skyler! A toast to the groom. To the groom. To the groom. To the groom. To the bride. To the bride. From your sister. Angelica. Angelica. Always by your side. To your union. To the union. To the revolution. And the hope that you provide. So, Nevin, I wanted to ask you, um, I was really thrilled when Disney gave us this particular clip because this to me was one of the great, the great moments of, of theatrical sound design in the piece. You've got, you've got this beautiful transition into a memory. Um, and can you talk about, um, kind of conceptually the, the rewind and what's happening physically on stage and how you approach the sound design for that moment. And also, was that part of the concept from the original beginning from the workshops and through the, the production of the public? And did it become bigger as you, as the houses got bigger? Just talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I first learned about that moment when we sort of put it on its feet, uh, in, uh, in the workshop and then into the production of the public and sort of the later stages there. And, um, you know, were was exposed to what not only the musical moment that had been crafted by Lynn and Lack and and demoed uh, for me, but also the the choreographic moment, the physical the physical action of the ensemble and the and of our uh, Angelica and Eliza, and just sort of getting your head around everything that was supposed to happen in that in the over those those bars and. Uh, try and basically live up to the gesture because it's a it's a huge musical gesture and a huge physical gesture happening. So that's how that's how that got expanded to something so big, basically, because what's happening on stage is 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 you know tectonic. It's really it's incredible with the turntable moves and the ensemble. The ensemble is actually reversing the choreography they just did in Helpless and uh, Angelica is is in the in the middle of this swirl of activity, which is a, a a, 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 a reverse reenactment of the previous musical piece uh, to arrive at uh, at her internal life, and so that that arc, uh, which was sketched out, as I said, in a demo that uh, that Lynn had done uh, with with actually with his vocals on it uh, as a guide, um, was was then combined with material that Lack provided uh, and uh, Scott Wasserman, who was uh, working on electronic music, and Will Wells, who was working on electronic music, and and all of that was incorporated into that template, which then we uh, we layered on the very heavily processed vocals of our two uh, leading ladies, uh, our Angelica and our Eliza, and then crafted this this sort of symphony of sound that terminates in the uh, in in the the right hand on the uh, is that a harp flack. I think uh, it, uh, yeah, it starts with a harp at the beginning, yeah. like a reverse harp, yeah, yeah. a bunch of other noise. 
Yeah. And just before the drop, when Angelica raps and tells us what's on her mind, and it's, you know, it's an extraordinary moment in the theater. And, and uh, you know, to speak to the immersive sense, you know, uh, what we were discussing before, how some of that actually bleeds into the surrounds and then snaps back to the stage. So we get this sort of thing that starts in two dimensions, becomes three dimensional as it swirls around Angelica, and then immediately just snaps back to almost a like, if you want to say almost a black and white, it becomes a two dimensional moment where we really get to then zoom back in and focus on what Angelica is going to say next. Cause the next thing out of her mouth is so important and so crucial and so isolated in the midst of what was this, uh, incredible epic shift of bodies and music. So it's, it's very exciting in the theater. And, and, you know, it, it was really out of, I mean, for lack of a better word, those moments, you're just, you, you really are just trying to live up to the material. I mean, I think, you know, I, I spent a lot of time feeling like, on Hamilton in general, but satisfied in particular of being responsible for communicating everything that was just written and that was on stage. That if you could, if I could accompany that and help communicate it and help move that story forward, that I, I will have, I will have done my job for that very short period of time in a very long show. But if you do that enough times and you string enough of those together, you know, you can, you can have some success, but that, that was a huge, that was a huge job. And, but it's a real, as a, as with everything, it's a team effort. Some of the big immersive moments that, uh, that are in the home theater mix that, that are really bold, creative choices. Did they kind of take their inspiration from things that you did, um, like going through the surround speakers and the theatrical? I'm thinking of like the overhead cannons that we heard in Outgunned and Outmanned or the DJ scratch that kind of wrapped around the room in the 10 Dual Commandments. Were some of those kind of inspired by the original theatrical mix? I mean, I like to think so, but I, I'm going to throw, I think all credit, all credit to, to, to Tony and Rob and Dan and those guys. Like, you know, when I first encountered the mix, when, when Tony first put it up for us in its original form after it had been worked on by Tim and Dan and, and Derek and Lack and, and, you know, some of our music staff. And I heard the initial 7-1 mix, you know, Tony had already created a cinematic world that I think was like the next level. Like, you know, there are things we can do in a theater that, um, that, that are very exciting and they, but they, to a certain extent, they always must relate to the live, the live performance. And, and you don't want to break the, the sort of bargain you've made with the audience that this is still happening live and that it's being played live and being acted live. And in cinema, you know, there's, there are other tools that, that, you know, this team knows better than me. And when I encountered it, I, I was already sort of amazed that, that they had expanded the universe of the, of the, of what was available to help tell that story. And some of the immersive elements were, uh, were both uh, unique or even more extravagant than we had done in the theater because they could be. And I, I, I think it was uh, exciting to hear the imagination of people who weren't there from the beginning, who are encountering the material, you know, sort of at first listen and first sight and saying, oh, what if we did this? What if this material went out there? I learned a lot uh, watching watching this team mix the movie about what can be done in the cinema uh, that, that I wouldn't have thought of. And I'm, you know, I hope moving forward that I'll be able to bring some of that back into my work in, in live as well. Alex, can you talk a little bit about um, um, your involvement with the preparation of the of the cinema and streaming mix? And and I, I know that that you were on the you know mixing stages as, as well. So can you talk a little bit about that that experience and what that was like for you? This was sort of a, a new thing for you to explore too, right? God, yeah, I, I learned so much in in this process. It was really uh, fantastic for me because. Uh, you know, I, I, theater making is something I've been lucky enough to do a lot, but movie making is, music is, is not, is something that's, it's relatively new to me. But, um, yeah, I mean, I have to say in terms of getting this stuff tracked, that was the easy part. You know, that was us just performing the show as we knew how. But beyond that, uh, for the cinematic stuff, it, it, it was important for me to have people on my team be involved, uh, because they knew the show so well. That's, you know, I, I believe I was the one that mentioned Tim Latham and getting him to do the pre-mixing and getting Derek Lee to help do the cleanup because they were so integral to the making of the cast album and already knew what that was. And, you know, the cast album had a, a sound that we all loved and I felt that that was true to the show. So we wanted to kind of preserve that in a way. Um, 
And then uh, beyond that, it was also, as Dan mentioned, some of the vocal uh, cleanup in terms of muting mics and also just internal balances. And that, uh, once Dan and I sat down and started to do it the way we wanted to, as he said, like an album, we realized more and more that it was taking much more time than I had in my schedule with some other uh, 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 things that I had pending. So I started to bring other associates of mine, Kurt Crowley, Matt Gallagher, uh, Ian Weinberger, who are all musicians who work on the show, were sitting side by side with Dan going through, making sure that the ensemble vocals from singer to singer were uh, uh, blended enough uh, to make sure that if there was a cutoff that was just errant, that went too long, that that was cleaned up. Because one of the things I wanted to mention is that, you know, I, and I learned that, that there's a lot of things that you forgive in a theater that, oh, it, it just washes over you, right? It, it gets part of the reverb. It's part of the sonic experience that when you're in a theatrical experience and it's right in front of you, you notice a lot more imperfections than you would have. So all of a sudden things that were, uh, you know, if, if it was the intention for the or vocals to be blended, yes, let's try to edit that and make it so. If it was the intention for the vocals to cut off sharply on beat three, but a couple of singers couldn't do that ex precisely because they were in different parts of the stage and one might have been in the wings and one might have been you know 10 feet up in the surround the intention was for it to be together but you might not have noticed that they were together in the theater but all of a sudden it was very apparent in in the the mixing experience so um that that was the thing that we uh, uh played with and then i think my big contribution was just making sure that the show felt uh like it served the story if there were orchestral colors that i felt were missing i would bring them up to tony uh and, and yeah, you know, I, and then Nevin had a lot to to say in terms of the way this, this the thing felt in translating the live experience, which is something that I'm so proud of because that's something that I don't know much about. And for people like Nevin and Tony to be able to just drop that one little piece of advice to say, oh, the room mics are too hot, like oh, the reverb is too wet, or oh, the EQ on the cello is not quite right. That that's not totally my expertise. It's more of a, a, a a big picture kind of thing, if you will, no pun intended. Um, so just hearing the interchange that they had and, and the little subtle shifts that they did and suggested that would completely change the feel of the movie. And a big credit goes to, to Tony on this one, because I remember uh, Roberto and Tony, the first time we got the mix for um, the, the streaming version, um, you know, we listened to it and we noted it and, and, you know, it sounded, okay, this is what we have to work with. But Tony just made like the one subtle suggestion to just say that, hey, the room mics are just too hot. And all of a sudden, he just directed Roberto to make one global adjustment that was very tiny, that changed everything. And all of a sudden, things were so much clearer and more present. I would never have known how to say that. I would never have known to, to, to that that's what it needed, but it, it is certainly what it needed. And, um, you know, and one thing we haven't talked about is the process of making this all happen during a pandemic shutdown. <laughs> and for this, I, I, I don't know how we did it, Glenn. And honestly, it's like, once we knew that we were going to release it, and as Roberto said, we, we had about a month to turn it around, it's nearly impossible to do what happened in that month in terms of the amount of time the creative team had to watch the film over and over again to give notes, the amount of time that Roberto had to spend in there tweaking and printing and rendering so that we could listen to it. And I got to tell you, you know, there was a lot of years on it, right? It was Tommy Killer, director. It was Jonah Morna, editor. It was me. It was Nevin. Uh, all of us were uh, chiming in. Roberto and his team and Tony, they got in every single one of our notes. I presume at some point that Lynn Manuel listened to it as well. Yeah, and right? Lynn as well. But I have to say, and, and again, like I, I love Lynn so much. He had like four notes because he was so happy with what he heard. And again, back to the collaborative spirit of Lynn. He's like, "Hey, you guys, I, I trust you guys, you know, with, with my baby." So he, he he let us chime in the way we needed to. Um, but uh, yeah, I. I you usually want to be able to do these things in a room together, listening to the same source and being able to react after the same things. But the fact that we were able to give notes remotely, the fact that Roberto was able to implement them remotely and to spend however many hours. And I, you know, I'm sure he spent way more than the clock allowed him to. And he found more hours in the day to get done uh, what needed to get done, but all in service of trying to give the best possible product all in service of, of trying to preserve our, our, our show and have it be presented in the best light possible. Like, I, I really feel like we got in everything that, that we intended to do. And that was no small feat given the time constraint and given the, the, the lack of, of, of um, physical proximity that we have with each other. It was, it was truly a superhuman feat that these guys pulled off. Well, kudos to you, Rob. I know you were you, you had to mix by yourself. You guys, were, you were doing this as New York was going into lockdown, right? Correct. Uh, but but uh, I want to add something to what Alex said, which I think 
in a way, I mean, a good byproduct of having to work under the lockdown was that at sending the mix out to everyone, I don't know, to me, sort of like allowed each person to to listen to the mix and take the notes at their own pace or however they preferred and had listened to however they preferred. So I, I at the end, I mean, it was an immense amount of work. But at the end, when I listened to it, I'm like, you know, this is the, the, the end result to me was so good partially because I felt the quality of the notes were so good. I felt like he got he got sort of dissected to a level that he probably wouldn't have if all of us were in the same room together. It's like each person dissected, you know, and 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 I and I could tell that I was getting, you know, certain notes from Alex, different from the notes from Nevin, and each person was concentrating in a different area, but I that's the main reason why I wanted to get to all of them because I know that they were addressing different things. And and I think that's what you get with the end result. It's like we sort of like there was the this team of people looking at this thing through a microscope and detecting every little thing. And and we were able to, you know, do it all together. That's why I, I felt it was really important to get to all the notes because uh, uh, otherwise this experiment, you know, we wouldn't know the full potential of the experiment. It's sort of, um, and, and again, like I was seeing it by the notes, like, oh, this person really concentrates on this one thing and this other person. So... Anyway, I think uh, uh, if there's, it was a good uh, end result out of out of the lockdown. Tony and Rob, um, so the project went from a theatric, well, from the stage, of course, to a uh, originally conceived as a theatrical seven point one mix or a cinema seven point one, and then a home entertainment Dolby Atmos mix. With cinema, you have more room with dynamic range. How loud can loud be? How quiet can quiet be? For home, you have to constrain it a little bit, but it's still such an effectively dynamic mix. Um, a wait for it. Just that one song goes from almost a whisper to just a thunderclap. Um, Yorktown, I thought I was going to get complaints from my neighbors, honestly. Um, it was <laughs> it, it was such a really engaging and dynamic mix, but it's also something you have to be careful about for the home environment so that you know, you don't have to ride the remote between it's too loud, it's too quiet. How did you how did you kind of handle transitioning from a, a cinema mix to that home theater mix, but still retain the energy of the show? There were very, very little specific adjustments. There was really the global, you know, bring it down to a to a level where, uh, you know, it has to clear the Disney specs. And then I think that was like the very was that I think that was the very first thing that I did. That f- that first week, I wasn't interacting with the crew that much. It's sort of like I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take this first week to get all these technical issues worked out, and then I'll start interacting with them about the creative notes. So during that time, I remember like, the very first thing I did is like, it, it's play it, sort of get a sense for the level that it was at. I, I think then I was talking to Tony. We agreed to bring it down. Then I played. I played it several times uh, during that week, and then I mean there were like some areas we needed to come up uh, a little bit. But I mean the show was it was it was pretty tight as it was at, for the theatrical version, so we didn't need to make too many adjustments in the in the home theater. Yeah, and you were in a home theater uh, mix room, right? Like a near field style mix room, or as opposed to a cinema stage, Rob. Uh, it's a room that can be both. It's this room that I'm in right now. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so it, yeah, it could it could be both. It could it can be tuned to do either one. So it was tuned for home theater. Yeah. And a, and a shout out to uh, Harbor Studios in New York, uh, which is where Tony uh, and and Rob and Dan, you guys are you guys are based. So that both the uh, both the the theatrical seven point one and the home at most mix were done at at Harbor Studios, which is a, a fantastic facility there in Manhattan. Let's take a listen to. We have one more clip. We have um, we have the room where it happened, and I have to say, um, you know, I, I've watched. Like I said, I've watched it the, the film twice um, in the last four days, and I cannot get this damn song out of my head. The room where it happened. So thanks for that, Alex. I really, really, really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. There, there are there are a number of pretty uh, earwormy songs in in this show, uh, but I love this one. This is uh, I think one of the, one of the most exciting. And to, to me, like Act Two is just it's it's showstopper after showstopper after showstopper. And one of the things I love about Lin Manuel as an artist um, is that he he gave everybody 
seemingly a great huge moment in in act two um and this is uh this, this is a, a great moment uh with a, a great performance a number of great performances so let's take, let's take a listen to the room where it happened two virginians and an immigrant walk into a room diametrically opposed foes they emerge with a compromise having open doors that were previously closed the immigrant emerges with unprecedented financial power, a system he can shape however he wants. The Virginians emerge with the nation's capital. And here's the piece de resistance. No one else was in the room where it happened, the room where it happened, the room where it happened. No one else was in the room where it happened, the room where it happened, the room where it happened. No one really knows how the game is played, the art of the trade, how the sausage gets made. We just assume that it happens But no one else is in the room where it happens so one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about this, and, and Tom um, mentioned earlier just how clean this mix is, um, and you know there's no you know, uh, you know bleed through from uh, performers' mics and whatnot. But the the other thing that I noticed is like this is a this is a it looks like a wooden set in a Broadway show house. I presume that that is wood. Um, you got a lot of actors clomping around thundering up and down stairs, <laughs> wearing period bustles and costumes. None of that is stage, in the track. Stage moving, stage turn. The, sta uh, the, the mechanics of the stage moving. This track is so clean. There is nothing distracting from the music and the vocals and the emotion. So how the hell did you guys accomplish that? I presume that, you know, if I was in the Richard Rogers listening to the show live, I would have gotten some noise of the environment and the actors moving around and the choreography and the steps. and the, So talk about that. Dad, did some of that start from you in terms of the editing process? Yeah, I think it was all that good work we put in, Alex, with all the, the ensemble vocals. I feel like it was day in and day out if we just look at this stuff and they're not singing into large diaphragm condenser mics in the studio. It's a, it's a mic pinned in their hair. So it's flying around and it's cut it out when they're singing. And it's about getting the ratios just right until everything's good. So, Alex, I think every day you're just like, there's more in there, you know? It's like there's, there's, more, there's more information in there. And it's like it was just, it's, it's like emotional signal-to-noise ratio. We just needed to get it all <laughs> perfect and right there. And I feel like that's where the, so a lot of the magic is, Alex, is those harmonies, carrying that thing through and making it seem surreal, you know? I feel like that's, that's where the, the joy is in that piece for me. Some of the big company numbers, how many mics would you have open at once? Because it, it is a fairly big company when, when they're all singing at once. I mean, sometimes it's 20. Yeah, yeah, 10 principals and then uh, 11 ensemble members. And there are, times, there are times where they're all singing. Yeah. While I was mixing, Dan was in one of the other studios at Harbor. Uh, using his tools, Dan's so great at cleaning things up. That's not that's not, that's not that's not a cleanup. That was major surgery. That, that, <laughs> the, work, the work is so. What, what you guys what, what you guys have arrived at is such a just a beautiful distillation of the emotion of the piece with nothing to distract from it, which is fantastic. Well, as as we were mixing, uh, we might uh, you know Tommy would hear these things sometimes like oh there's a little you know some weird little noise in between these words or something like that mm -hmm. and if i couldn't easily get it out while i was mixing or we didn't want to take the time because we had bigger fish to fry dan was in another room we, he had an, a, an identical session that i had in the other room and sometimes alex would go in there with them and they would do do their magic and clean this thing up and i would get it back and i'd be like oh my god how'd you get rid of that across 100 mics you know somebody coughing in the inappropriate time or um you know or the stage moving at a very like it was very tricky and near the end when it gets very quiet but the stage is is turning and you hear the you hear all that yep only heard the stage once yeah so, so we were able to clean a lot of that stuff up, um, and Dan should, takes a lot of that credit. He was he was masterful at, at cl post cleaning a lot of stuff. Excellent. I mean, I was lucky that, uh, that a new version of Isotope came out while we were working that allowed me to work on <laughs> six, sixteen tracks at once. It was very very helpful. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, and you guys, um, you know, as as Tom mentioned, you use dynamic range, so so 
beautifully, but there are also there was also so much. There were a number of moments that I, I noticed the second time I was listening to it about where um, you know we talked about um, uh, and satisfied, but there's also a moment that I made a note of in in Burn um, when Eliza has that beautiful moment, and it's one of the most it's one of the most beautiful lyrics in the in the show for me when she says, "I'm erasing myself from the narrative," and I f- I feel like the 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 music largely steps back at that point like you you carved out a beautiful moment for that one line to just kind of come through and hit the audience full force and it was just it's beautiful beautiful work this, that really shines as far as a, a theatrical mix and a music mix i mean it's it's one thing putting up these hundreds of mics and just playing them straight across but going through the theatrical sort of work that we were used to cleaning tracks up only have the mics on when they need to be on um really presents it in the the best possible way you know yeah. and that's 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 what really shined you know throughout the process Nevin, you talked about the uh, sound design having a lot of uh, low frequency hip hop style. Um, Tony and Rob, did you use the LFE channel at all? A lot of music mixes they keep it confined to the full range channels and really don't rely on the LFE track. But some of the effect elements, like I'm thinking, I had a note. Um, oh, helpless! My heart went boom, and you have that kind of frequency sweep. Did did you play with the subwoofer for that, or not? Not really. Well. Um that's a great question. Uh, but as I mentioned before, yeah, I was really impressed when I went to see the show live, the, the low frequency and, and being sort of a hip hop show wanted to preserve that. So I was afraid of relying on the subwoofer too much, uh, cause everyone's systems are set up a little bit differently and I didn't want to rely just on the subwoofer for all that base information. So I set up, uh, what we do sometimes, uh, this, technique that we call it thickener, a little thickener, which is basically sending subharmonic low frequency information, but to the main speakers rather than just the subwoofer. Um, and we use that, that quite a bit throughout the mix just to help enhance the lower frequencies. And that way, if you're someone's listening on their laptop or a stereo mix, uh, just on some stereo speakers or headphones, they're not going to lose those subharmonic low frequencies just because there's no subwoofer there. But um, t- t- you're right. There were specific moments, you know, maybe uh, cannon fire, things like that, where we pushed a little extra just into the subwoofer just for that, that moment. Um, um, Rob can certainly chime in about uh, further enhancing it in the uh, Atmos world. Uh, no, it's the same approach. I mean, there were only a couple of instances uh some sound effects where, like I said, Tony had already, in the theatrical version, he had already dialed in some of those frequencies into the front. So I really liked the way it sounded. I didn't want to mess it up, but I thought maybe I would extend it a little lower. Uh, so, and I think on, I think, was it, Here Comes the General, if I remember correctly, I think there's maybe two numbers where we're, I try to extend a couple of instruments down into the sub, but... Uh, that was it. We, we uh, I didn't want to change the tone too much of the theatrical mix, which I knew the team already liked, and uh, and, and it sounded good. So, one thing I thought was very cool about how you got everybody immediately immersed into the Hamilton style was from the first second of the Walt Disney Pictures banner. Um, the, you know, the fireworks over the Disney Castle. It was the Hamilton like cannon and gunshot sound and I'm like right from the get-go you were doing really interesting sound design can you tell me just a little bit about who was like hey let's play with that so I, I believe that was a Tommy Kale special our, our director Tommy Kale uh, you know thought right away that it was about trying to you know put our, 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 our stamp on the movie somehow so I think he had asked Jonah Moore and our editor to put something together and he did it basically using found elements from the score so Jonah uh, went and looked into right hand man he looked into Tendo commandments and found a, a bunch of sound effects and then I saw it on a cut 
And I'm like, this is fantastic. That's great. And then I suggested, hey, can we get Will Wells, our music producer, on board as well? So Will Wells contributed to it, and then he beefed up some of the sounds and added a couple of other colors just to uh, just put a, a finishing touch on it. Uh, Nevin listened to it. I, I think we found some of Nevin's old sound effects as well, and we used some like you know period style gunshots and cannon fire, et cetera, et cetera. But it was all hands on deck. But the idea, uh, uh, Tommy was the one who, who started it, I believe. But but again, it's one of these things where it became all hands on deck, right? It became the entire team listening to it and throwing ideas uh, and and just trying to uh, make a, an already great idea as excellent as possible. So that's one of the things I love about the collaborative process of theater is the you know that the feeling of everyone after the same thing the, the feeling of everyone trying to make something the best it can be and uh which i think translates to what it was the work on the film like everyone cared about it so much and everyone wanted it to be great uh and and because of that i really think that the product has a, has a lot of love to it it's love that you feel from the top down all the way through the process and there's a real uh, you know I, I think there's passion in the actual making of this piece in all levels and and that's something that i think you feel even as you watch it from 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 your home and on your couch and sweatpants <laughs> <laughs> it was a great touch it got you into the mood of the show right right from the top well i think that's a great way to go out unless anybody uh has any any other points they'd like to make before we wrap up you guys are my heroes i love you <laughs> it's 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 so good it's so good you know it's it's something i think we can all be proud of it's like no no regrets it's amazing you guys you guys should be very proud i think you know you you accomplished uh, a really challenging feat which is to give people the experience of what it was like to be in the theater and and experience that show and it was it was really you got the passion and the energy and uh and, it, and it's really remarkable so congratulations to everybody it's just uh it's an amazing experience watching the show. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Glenn. Well, uh, guys, that's uh, that's another episode of the Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection podcast. I want to thank again Alex and Nevin, Tony, Rob, Dan. Thanks for coming on the show and talking to us about um, this really special process of putting Hamilton uh, first on the big screen and then on the small screen. Thank you guys for spending the time with us today. Thank you. Had a great time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Great. You. Well, that's another episode of the podcast. Uh, thanks for tuning everyone. Till next time. <laughs>